Hello and welcome to the Tron Church Podcast. This week, instead of our usual Talking Points series, we're bringing you a recording from Bob on Bonhoeffer, a recent event we ran for our growth groups here at the Tron. In it, Bob File takes us through the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and draws out some of the major lessons which we as Christians today can learn from him and the brave and costly stand which he took against the Nazi regime in Germany. There is so much wisdom here for us to learn from, and we trust that you'll enjoy listening to Bob's unpacking of it. So without further ado, here is Bob on Bonhoeffer. Hebrews 12 tells us we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, those who have run the race before us, those who have reached the finishing post, and who inspire us to keep on running, particularly in times of difficulty. Now that verse goes on to tell us, of course, we fix our eyes on Jesus. We don't fix our eyes on Bonhoeffer or on anyone else. Nevertheless, the point is we can learn from those who have run the race. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when the call came in Nazi Germany, who is on the Lord's side? He stood firm. He gave his life. So there's obviously things we can learn from him. I want to do two things this evening. First of all, to talk about his life. Now, some of you may know a great deal. Some of you know very little. But it's important to put him in context. Because very often, when we talk about people, we forget the context in which they lived, the context in which certain words have been spoken. He, as you can see, he had a short life, 1906 to 1945, dying just weeks before the Second World War ended. And we'll come to that. So first of all, I want to look at his early days. Bonhoeffer was part of a very large family, eight children. That wasn't uncommon in those days. He had, <clears throat> he had four sisters, one of them was his twin, Sabine, and he never, ever allowed her to forget that she was born 10 minutes later than him. And he had three brothers. Now, although it was a big family, there was no poverty. His father was a distinguished neurosurgeon and psychiatrist. Indeed, probably the most distinguished neurosurgeon in, in the German world at that time. And his mother was a teacher. So they were comfortably off, and he didn't know anything like poverty or deprivation. They were, he was born in Breslau, which at that time was in Poland. But they moved to Berlin in 1912, when his father was given a chair. That's a university chair, of course. He became, became professor, and they were part of a very distinguished um, group of people, distinguished society, an influential family. They were also interested in the arts, in music and literature. Now, that's important for later on, so keep that in mind. That's the kind of background. Now, in 1914, there was the outbreak of the Great War. It's interesting that historians, even after the Second World War, still refer to this war the First World War, as the Great War. He, of course, Bonhoeffer himself, was far too young to be personally involved. Nevertheless, they, it came right into family life when his elder brother, who had been called up, was killed in 1917. And then the war ended with the Versailles Treaty. The important thing about the Versailles Treaty was it paved the way for Hitler. I remember long ago when I was doing higher history, probably don't even call it higher history nowadays, uh, my history teacher saying the Allies won the war, but they didn't win the peace. The, the peace was too humiliating to Germany, and therefore the way was prepared for someone to emerge who was going to promise to give them back their self-respect. So his early days, and in the, first of all in Breslau, and then in Berlin. And then we look now at his interest in theology. That's on the second page. Um, Bonhoeffer knew what he wanted to do from a very early age. At 14, 
he decided he was going to be a theologian or pastor. And at various points in his life, he couldn't make up his mind which of these aspects he was going to specialize in. His family didn't exactly discourage him, but they weren't encouraging either. They, they said the church is poor, it's feeble, it has no future. And Bonhoeffer replied, well, I shall have to reform it then. So you see, already at that early age, he is showing a, a, a determination, a commitment. But, and in 17, he began his studies at Tübingen and then at Berlin. At that time, these were famous centers of theological study. And he was a very distinguished student. And it, he all, it seemed set that he was going to have a, a very um, eminent career as a theologian, doing pastoral work as well. Because by 1930, he became lecturer in systematic theology in Berlin University, having behind him very distinguished degrees. And it seemed as if that was him set for the future. However, when Hitler came to power in 1933, Bonhoeffer saw the writing on the wall and he abandoned his academic career. <clears throat> so you see, up till that time, his life is one of privilege. His life is one of comfort. His life is one of um, great interest, expanding interest. As I said, he wasn't, wasn't only interested in theology. He loved the arts, he loved music, and he wrote poetry. And indeed, he wrote a poem which became a hymn and which we're going to sing at the, at the end of this evening. So he was a very cultured and very, uh, and very interesting man. However, the next stage in his life we'll call growing conflict. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going into the detail. The detail is a fascinating story. And I've mentioned at the end of the handout this biography by a man called Eric Metaxas. It looks big, but it is extremely readable. And one of the things about it, which the various endorsements all point out, is that it reads like an exciting novel. It's not that Metaxas is writing fiction, it has a strong narrative drive. So if you're interested in Bonhoeffer, suggest you get this. It's not all that dear either. I can't remember what price it is, but it's not all that dear. And he's a pastor, martyr, prophet, and spy. Interesting. Now, the point is, various exit routes presented themselves. He, was already, he already realized that in Hitler's Germany, there was no place for the kind of work he wanted to do. In 1928, he became curate in Barcelona for a year, and he was asked to stay. People liked him, people appreciated him, they wanted him to stay. Of course, as events, as events developed, Spain would hardly have been more um, congenial than, than Germany, but he didn't know that at the time. Then in 1930, he went to Union Theological Seminary in New York for further study. <clears throat> and along with that, he had ministry experience in downtown New York. Now, there he found situations he hadn't experienced before. He found extreme poverty. He found a spiritual life which had been hitherto lacking in his experience of churches. Um, powerful singing, powerful, uh, very strong spiritual life. And that influenced him profoundly. So you see, the two things are going on at the same time. He's continuing his theological interests, which never left him, but he's also opened his heart to this new and um, more... I don't want to use... I don't, I'm using the word emotional in a good sense. You know, the more emotional experience of faith in downtown New York. And then in 1934, he was invited to, to London to pastor two German-speaking congregations. And he did go, but he felt extremely uncomfortable. And he visited Berlin every two weeks, phoned his family and friends every few days. So it's obvious 
that he wasn't looking for an exit route from difficulty. He wanted to carry out his mission as he saw it in Germany. And then developed the conflict of the Reichskirche, the established church, which accepted Hitler. And the confessing church, which Bonhoeffer, I almost call them Beethoven, with, the, with um, Pastor Martin Neumuller, were particularly influential in founding. Now, the Reichskirche had an oath of loyalty for its ministers. I swear before God that I will be true and obedient to the Führer of the German people and state, Adolf Hitler. Hard for us to imagine that that could have become part of the church's um, policy, but that was the case. And you can see there's this conflict developing. <coughs> and that actually explains some of the things that Bonhoeffer was to say later on which people have misunderstood. I'll, I'll come back to that. So and when he returned to Germany, he went to a place called Zingst, which is a peninsula on the Baltic coast. There was a derelict retreat center there, and he went there to lead an illegal seminary for the confessing church. He realized there was no, nothing to be gained by sending young men into the state church. And therefore, he felt they had to found something else. High-quality scholarship, as well as a life of prayer and fellowship. Mornings and evenings, there were regular daily prayers. But he was also interested, I say, in sport and culture. So opportunities of sport, opportunities to visit theatres and concerts and so on. And he took training in preaching very seriously. He basically he emphasized the, the, the passage in the early Acts. They continued in the apostles' teaching. And if they were going to continue in the apostles' teaching, then they had to be taught. And he emphasized that. Now, I think what becomes very important is he saw the danger of Hitler before many others did. And in particular, he warned of the dangerous, indeed idolatrous, use of the word Führer. I'm going to come back to that in the second part when I talk about what we can learn from him. I just mentioned it just now. And indeed, he refused to be called Herr Director Bonhoeffer. He said, call me brother, Bruder Bonhoeffer. He, he was determined not to have a hierarchical system there which didn't, of course, mean anything went because he was, pretty, he, he was pretty certain what he wanted to do and he made sure that the students were, were following that. In 1937, perhaps inevitably, the Gestapo closed the seminary. Now, Bonhoeffer continued for a time. What he did was he took the teaching and much of the, the life of the seminary to various confessing churches now, once again, the confessing churches weren't all equally convinced along with Bonhoeffer. There were, you know, there was a wide variety of, of, of views there. Some of them didn't like the Reichskirk for different reasons, you know, for political reasons. But as he returns, as he's returned to Germany, he's recognized that if he's going to continue his ministry, his teaching, his pastoral work, it can't be done through the channels he had hoped to, through the Reichskirk and through the universities. So he establishes something. And the point, the point that becomes obvious from any reading of, of his life is that he was determined that this seminary was going to be as rigorous and as authoritative on theology as the universities and that the pastoral work was going, to be, was going to be broad in the sense of taking on board what he had discovered in New York in different kinds of circumstances from the middle class um, he was accustomed. Now, what I call discerning the times, well, we're going to come back to that later on. So I say he saw the danger of Hitler and that's a lesson to us. We need to see how trends that are happening now 
are likely to develop. That's one thing I want to talk about, particularly in the second part of the talk, but it's worth mentioning just now. <clears throat> in 1938, with war clouds gathering, another exit route presented himself. He was offered a post at Union Seminary in New York. Now, he went there because, like many another, in many different circumstances, he felt, well, this might be a way I can continue my ministry and have a godly influence. But he returned in July. The main reason he returned, of course, was because he wasn't prepared to abandon the work in Germany. But there were other reasons. He found Union theology shallow. There was no real wrestling with the big theological issues and questions. What there was an awful lot of was what you might call um, partisan debates between fundamentalists and liberals, but without actually engaging in the big issues. So he was there briefly, a few months, in return. <clears throat> now, so, as I say, that's a, a very brief summary of what you can read in much more detail in Metaxas, and it's, it's a story worth reading. Let's look now at his final years. One thing that I didn't know and I was surprised and delighted to discover, Bonhoeffer fell in love. In June 1942, he met a girl called Marie, Marie von Wedmeyer. I have never done any German, and my pronunciation may not be as good as what I would like it to be, so forgive me. She was the granddaughter of a family friend. <clears throat> In fact, he went there on a pastoral visit. She had lost her husband. He went there to try to comfort her. And there he met Marie, her granddaughter. Now, he was 36, and she was 18. By all accounts, he was totally smitten. He fell head over heels in love. I was delighted to read that, and because it does, it does humanize him in a way you might not get from the earlier story. She took longer, but she came to love him dearly, and they planned to marry. And one of the poignant things about these later years is she was already preparing the wedding. So it's a, it's a sad tale, and a sad tale of what might have been. But these years, as I say, these later years, Bonhoeffer in love. And the other, of course, the other feature, of course, of these late years was he was in prison. He was arrested, probably inevitably, in 1943 by the Gestapo, and he was taken to Tegel Military Prison in Berlin. Now, this, isn't, this wasn't as bad as it might have been. I mentioned earlier on that it was important his family were influential. Now, it happened that um, his uncle was military commandant in Berlin, and therefore responsible for the prisons, and that was well known, and that meant that Bonhoeffer was treated more leniently than he might have been. But I think it also shows his kind of man he was. When he was offered a better cell, for example, he said, does that mean that somebody else will have to take this one? And said, of course. So he refused. And similarly, when he was offered more food, he refused. That was the kind of man he was. He was a man who cared deeply, not just for theology, but for other, for people. He was a pastor. That is very important to remember. But this meant, among other things as well, he was able to have books and write letters in prison. And indeed, some of the guards he became very friendly with, because it's obvious that not every official in Nazi Germany was enamored with Hitler. And there were guards in that prison who were sympathetic to Bonhoeffer. Indeed, there was a plot to try and rescue him at one point. That came to nothing, once again, sadly, but it didn't happen. Then he was accused of being part of a plot. Oh, oh sorry. He's able to have books and write, including to Marie, and also to other friends. There was a man called Eberard Bethke. Now, Eberard Bethke wrote probably the definitive biography of Bonhoeffer. 
It's a very big book, even bigger than this. This book's about 600 pages. That one's 800. And it's, less, uh, it's a less riveting read. But nonetheless, it's, if, you're re if you're seriously interested, that is the one to get, because Metaxas acknowledges his debt to that book. And many of his theological ideas, and we'll come back to this, were expressed in these letters. That's an important thing to remember. Then, as I say, he was accused of being part of a plot to assassinate Hitler. Now, apart from leaders of the confessing church, there were a number of generals in the German army who were quite keen to get rid of Hitler. Some of them were Christian, some of them weren't, but they were increasingly alarmed at the way the Reich was going, at the way Hitler was behaving. And indeed, um, indeed, there was some attempt in the 1940s to enlist the help of Churchill's government. One of the generals was a friend of Sir Anthony Eden, who was Foreign Secretary at the time, and he got in touch with Eden. And once again, nothing came of this. Churchill, on Churchill's side, Churchill didn't trust the generals. He felt there weren't enough of them, and he felt they weren't committed enough. He had hoped earlier in the war that there might be a revolt in the army. That didn't happen. And on the, for their part, since Hitler had committed already one of his huge blunders of invading Russia, that was one of the things that ultimately, of course, led to his downfall. Um, and Churchill immediately allied himself with Stalin. And as you can imagine, that caused alarm in the confessing church. So it came to nothing. Interesting, I mean, that's many people in England didn't like Churchill as well for that. They felt, um, they felt that Stalin was a bigger danger than Hitler. But anyway, it's an interesting sideline on what, on what was happening. <clears throat> and he was taken to Buchenwald in 1944 and then to a place called Flossenburg. Now, Bonhoeffer and his fellow prisoners had real hopes of being freed. It was known the Allied armies were near. It was known that the Reich was collapsing. It was known that the war was already lost. So there was real hope that, and you could imagine, of course, his fiancée, as she was then, Marie, was really excited by this, and was beginning to plan a wedding. It's a very poignant, very sad story. But it didn't happen. He was hanged on April the 8th, 1945, and by all accounts died bravely, and he was very courageous. It was just three weeks before the Allies arrived, and just shortly after that, Hitler took his own life and the war came to an end. At least it came to a war, an end in the West. It still continued for some months in the Far East. But undoubtedly, if they had arrived in time, they'd have been liberated. The memorial service held on July 27th, the church whose name you'll recognize, Holy Trinity Brompton, famous now as the home of Alpha and for other things, and a friend of early student days preached on Second Chronicles 21:31, words of King Jehoshaphat faced by a huge army, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Now, it's a very appropriate, very, very appropriate text, and his parents who were still alive and the rest of his family it was recorded, they listened to it on the radio, and it must, they, uh, I mean, it's hard to imagine their feelings, feelings both of sadness and yet of pride as well. Of this man who had, um, who had, I say, stood firm and not compromised at all. Now, that's just very, a very brief summary of his life and times, and, but I do recommend you read Metaxas. You may even get on to reading Bethke if you're really, if you, if you, if you're really interested. 
Now, the second thing I want to do is to talk about learning from Bonhoeffer. And I want to make one or two preliminary points. First thing is, he died when he was only 39. Some of you may think that's quite old. I think it's deliciously young. <laughs> and I, I hate to think what my ideas would have been if I died at that age. You know, his ideas were developing. They weren't fully formed. And the other thing is, the second thing is, many of these were him airing ideas, particularly this man, Bethke, fellow, a friend and a fellow theologian. We must always distinguish between heresy and people asking genuine questions. You see, if we, if we treat genuine questions the way we treat heresy, then we're very soon going to arrive at a situation where people are not interested in the Bible and theology at all, and where spiritual life is going to be stunted. The other thing is, he's writing these in prison. Now, as I say, prison wasn't as bad as it might have been. He was allowed books. But it's not quite like sitting in a library or a study surrounded by books and able freely to talk to others. So when we think, and there are many who are extremely critical of Bonhoeffer, I read a couple of articles just before I came here, which are critical, even scurrilous, about him. And I, I want to talk about two things in particular, because these two things cover an awful lot else. And the first thing is what Bonhoeffer called costly grace. Excuse me. Now, the devil hates grace, of course, because grace is the heart of the gospel. And there are two errors we can fall into about grace. And Bonhoeffer was aware of both of them. First is what we might call the gospel plus. That's the way of legalism. Oh, of course, Christ saves us, but we can't be truly Christian without following extra biblical rules and regulations. Now, it's not legalism to follow God's rules, but very often... Christian, Christian groups have added a set of other rules. What happened in ancient Judaism, what happens often in modern evangelicalism. See, legal, the problem with legalism, legalism's apt, adept at pointing out what is wrong. It's not so good at, at um, giving healing because Legalism creates a sense of guilt without alleviating it. <coughs> Sometimes legalism will lead to ridiculous extremes. <coughs> I heard the story of a young minister who went to a Highland church. And on his first Sunday, or Sabbath as they called it, <coughs> he, sorry, excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. <coughs> And on his first Sunday, he and his wife went for a walk. And when he, when he came to the evening service, his elders faced him, simmering with indignation. And the session clerk says, Is it true that you and your wife went for a walk on the Sabbath? He says, Yes. He says, Our Lord went for a walk on the Sabbath. And the session clerk replied, Yes, we wouldn't have got away with that up here. <laughs> now, I don't know if that story is true or not. But it certainly fits in. I mean, I was brought up in legalism. And legalism, in some ways, is quite comfortable because you don't have to think there are rules for everything. But the trouble with legalism, everything becomes external. You can tell what kind of entertainment a person goes to. Not, of course, in the circles I was brought up and you are supposed to go to entertainment. You can tell how a person dresses. You can tell all these kind of things. You cannot tell if a person is walking with God. You see that? And Bonhoeffer was aware of that. And he said, and one of the things he said was um, that um, if we follow the way of legalism, we are following rules. We are not disciples of Christ. But the other way 
which he is also particularly conscious of, was the gospel minus the way of liberalism, what's sometimes called antinomianism. That's uh, the word nomos, is the Greek word for law. Cheap grace, which justifies the sin without justifying the sinner. It's what he says in this book, Cost of Discipleship. Um, He said, the cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without repentance, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field for the sake of which someone will gladly go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy which the, the, the merchant will, for which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. And one of the problems of cheap grace is it sounds gentle and kind, but it's ultimately cruel. Nothing is ever solved. Everything is swept under the carpet. It's a real problem. You know, cheap grace tends to, oh, well, every, we're, none of us are perfect. Just, just forget about it. You're no worse than anybody else. Bonhoeffer says, having laid hold of cheap grace, talking about a group of people he knew, they were forever barred from knowledge of costly grace. That is the problem. They had taken a, like a tiny dose and that inoculated them against the real, against the real thing. So from Bonhoeffer we learn this. Now, I think you'll agree with me that these two issues are still with us. They're still within our hearts, even, aren't they? And we've got to ask ourselves, which of the... And, and of course, human nature, contradictory human nature is such that we can in both places simultaneously. Very often, cheap grace for ourselves and costly grace for others. Antinomianism for us and legalism for everybody else. Now, I think we've got to, we've got to realise that if we're going to follow Christ, we've got to reject both. Because neither will cause us to grow in grace. Neither will transform us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So that's the first thing, costly grace. Grace at the very heart of, of the gospel. Now, the second thing I want to talk about is the nature of the enemy Bonhoeffer was particularly, I think, powerful in pointing out the nature of the enemy. <clears throat> and I, you've got printed on your sheet Revelation 13. I'm going to read that in a moment. Now, this comes at a critical point in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 12, we have the triumph of Christ, the, the child born whom the dragon attempts to devour then is caught up to God and to his throne. Shortest life of Christ ever risen. We go straight from the incarnation to the ascension. Michael and his angels defeat the devil and his angel. The devil is thrown out. So why is it that after Christ has risen and ascended, why is it that the Christian life seems even more difficult rather than easier? And this chapter is throwing on a, a flood of light on that. I remember on Sunday evening, Willie was talking about Genesis 6, about the demonization of humanity. Now, this is happening again here, the end of the Bible, emphasizing what is there at, at, at the beginning, the, that behind human evil, there is demonic activity. And in particular, there are two beasts. So let's, let's read this passage. (coughs) 
devil stands at the shore of the sea, the end of the previous chapter, and John writes, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon, the devil, gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words. He was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, with a sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Above all, it it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. This is the word of the Lord. And Satan Satan summons two beasts, one from the sea, the beast of persecution, and one from the land, the beast of propaganda. You notice this way, if you look, if you glance here at verse 11, it had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It looked like a lamb, but it spoke with its master's voice, its master, the dragon. See, this is a parody of the Trinity, the dragon parodying God the Father and the beast out of the sea who, who had a mortal wound and was healed, parodying Christ and the second beast, the Holy Spirit, who glorifies Christ. Now, the important thing in relation to Bonhoeffer is this, that Hitler exemplified both these beasts. Hitler did not come to power saying, I'll introduce one of the most oppressive regimes the world has ever seen. I'll massacre the Jews, and I'll get rid of every freedom you have ever enjoyed. No, Hitler came to power saying, I'll restore national self-respect. I'll sort out the economy. I'll I'll make sure that the nation is one you can be proud to live in. I remember many years ago, back in the 70s, seeing a a program as a studio discussion, and studio audience were asked, would you vote for a politician who did the following things. 
sorted the economy, made the trains run on time, put schools and universities on a good footing and all the rest of it? Of course, they all said yes. And then the, the leader of the program said, this is who you were voting for, and a picture of Hitler flashed up on the screen. Now, you see, that is, that is the kind of thing that Bonhoeffer realized earlier than others, that the, the apparent liberality of Hitler, the apparent desire to put the nation back on a proper footing, was simply a disguise to gain power. I've just, I've just finished reading a line, The Witch and the Wardrobe. Um, I read the Narnia stories every Advent. And of course, what the White Witch did with Edmund. She didn't say, I'm going to turn you into stone lad, I'm going to murder Aslan. She said, come with me and get loads of Turkish delight. I don't like Turkish delight, but I could imagine many things that I, that I do like. Which should... so, and this is the way it always works. This is the way, and the devil has been enormously successful with this second beast, even more than the first beast. Why is Christianity in the West in such a state today? If you go back a couple of centuries to the, the scholars and leaders of the church at that time, they didn't say, we are going to destroy people's faith in the Bible. We're going to empty the churches. No, they said, we are going to remove obstacles to belief. We are going to make it easier for people to believe in the Bible. And what did they do? They said, well, can't, nobody nowadays can believe in miracles and so on. So the Old Testament went out the window. And then, of course, they said, oh, we'll leave Christ untouched. The trouble is, of course, there's miracles there as well. The resurrection became the rise of resurrection faith in people's hearts. What happened? Did we see a flood of people returning to the churches? A flood of people interested in the Bible? Of course not. So the church is emptying. So the Bible being increasingly disbelieved. And that's exactly what's happening today as well. People who are pressing the, the, pressing the gay agenda are not saying, we want to, we, we want to um, discredit the faith. They're saying, we want to make it easier to believe in the faith. So we'll take away um, one, of the, one of the Christian early 19th century, Rudolf Bultmann said, we must demythologize the gospel. In other words, take away from the gospel everything that makes it the gospel <coughs> and reduce it to morality. And of course, once you take away the gospel doctrine, what happens to the gospel morality? We see it all around us. No one who doesn't believe in the gospel doctrine is really going to be serious about practicing the gospel lifestyle. And Bonhoeffer saw that early on. Now, <coughs> over the page. <coughs> Excuse me. Bonhoeffer recognized the importance of language. Those of you who know George Orwell's 1984 will know that, of course, the Ministry of Truth, destroying the meaning of words and thereby, and thereby creating a world where words like Humpty Dumpty can mean, as Humpty Dumpty said, can mean anything I want them to mean. Come back to the word Führer. Now, Führer, of course, is, is a neutral word in one sense. It means leader. But Bonhoeffer discerned something happening. This was becoming an idolatrous word. Rather like what was happening in the first century, probably the background of the book of Revelation. Domitian, the Roman emperor, in whose reign probably the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation, introduced what was called the emperor cult, which meant that people across the empire had to go to the pagan temple, uh, offer a pinch of incense, and say the words, Caesar is Lord, Caesar curios. I said, what? That doesn't sound all that problematic. Just saying two words. 
The problem was that at the very heart of the gospel are two other words, Jesus kurios, Jesus is Lord. And no Christian could give the word kurios, the word Lord, to anyone other than Jesus Christ. And that's what caused the clash with the empire. And that's what caused, made Beethoven... Re Beethoven, see... <laughs> Probably half asleep by now, Mosi. But Mosi didn't even notice that. Um, that's what that's what made Bonhoeffer suspicious. The word Führer was no longer simply meaning master or leader. Führer. It was used in reverential tones. Now, of course, I know some people say when they talk about the New Testament, the word kurios can simply be a ter an honorary term, an honorific meaning sir. Now, that's true. Think of Philippians 2. I really do imagine that God raised Jesus from the dead and exalted him to the heavenly glory so that we call him sir. It's absurd. And it was absurd in Nazi Germany. It's absurd now. Beethoven... See, once I've said it, and I'm going to keep on saying this. Anyway, um, see Phil looking at the clock. I'm nearly... I'm, I'm, I'm nearly finished. I was just laughing with everyone else. Yeah. So the point is, the, the point is that words aren't just neutral. And think about think what's happening today. Many people proclaim oh, we want diversity. This is this is a church that promotes diversity. Now, if words mean what they ought to mean, that ought to mean a church that welcomes everybody, whatever, whatever age you may be, whatever color you may be, and so on. But that's not what diversity means nowadays. Diversity means we welcome people who hold certain views, particularly views on the LGQBT issue. And similarly, the word tolerance. Now, tolerance used to mean what Voltaire, the French skeptic, said, about it, that I hate what you say, but I will fight to the death for your right to say it. Tolerance means nowadays you're only allowed to say certain acceptable things. You see the danger, and you can see it. Now, in Hitler's Germany, that <clears throat> the first he rapidly morphed into the second beast. Now, we don't know what will happen in this country, but it's you can see the danger, language being perverted and therefore reality being perverted. And we must realize that behind this is the master of lies. The devil is, the devil is a liar. And therefore the only way we can, of course, defeat him is by the proclamation of the truth. And... That's what, that's what we need to learn, I think, from Bonhoeffer, the nature of the enemy. We are not, as Paul says, fighting flesh and blood. We are fighting the principalities and powers. Now, I've lived through my life without this, that kind of persecution represented by the first beast. But increasingly, the second beast is becoming more and more dangerous and becoming more and more hostile. Now, we know that from... We, we see examples of this all around us. I mean, the, the MP along the road, I mean, John Mason was, um, was um, called out for his stand on abortion, for example. And we see there's all kinds becoming more and more and more difficult to stand in the public square for the Lord, and who knows where that will end. It's important that we see uh, where things are going. But when the call came, Bonhoeffer stood firm. Now, I just want to say this in closing, that I, I said I'd read these articles where Bonhoeffer is regarded as a heretic, um, 
Let me take one of the phrases he used, religionless Christianity. He wrote that in a letter from prison to his friend Everard Bethke. And he said, that's what we need. And that was taken up in the 50s and 60s by liberal theologians, the death of God theologians. What they failed to realize is that this was actually an attack on the Reichskirk, the state church, who were all for religion, but they didn't want discipleship. They didn't want a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what, that's what he was getting at. He wasn't talking about, he wasn't talking as Boltman and others were talking about demythologizing. He was talking about getting rid of the clutter of religion and instead concentrating on Christ. I think that's so important to remember. And it's so important also to remember, I want to emphasize this again, that he was thinking aloud. Now, had he lived Undoubtedly, he would have written other things. And if you want to read more about that, there is his Letters and Papers from Prison, which is, which is certainly worth reading. And also, of course, I recommend this book. If you want to get, get a clear idea of his thinking, this book, The Cost of Discipleship, this is mainly, but not exclusively, on the Sermon on the Mount. So he talks about costly grace and, and, and other, other such things. And it's easy in this book as well, if you take phrases out of context, to imagine he's saying something different from what he's saying. And we've got to remember, as I say, the, remember Matthew 7, judge not that you be not judged. Now that doesn't mean we must never make judgments, because of course the chapter goes on to about not casting perils before pigs. And... The, the, and the, the New Testament, the Old Testament, talk about discriminating against heresy and so on. What it means is we must make final judgments on people's lives. We are not the judge. On the last day, we will not be on the judgment seat. And just one other thing, um, just, just to round this off. Sometimes people have said to me that they feel guilty that they've not been persecuted. When, as we know, there is persecution, severe persecution in many countries today. I can understand that, but I think it's a profoundly mistaken thing to say. When we stand before the Lord, he isn't going to say, how did you deal with the persecution I didn't send you? He is going to be interested in what he did send us and how we reacted to that. <coughs> There's also a narrow, there's a grey area between persecution and propaganda. You know, persecution, meaning, of course, I suppose, violence, um, ill treatment, losing life. But I mean, the, the kind of propaganda, the nasty propaganda and political correctness, which is a fact of our life, can be terribly, terribly, terribly hurtful. Remember the old rhyme, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words will never hurt you. That's totally untrue. Words can hurt, hurt dreadfully, and the scar can remain long after the words are spoken. So Bonhoeffer, the great, among the great cloud of witnesses, not perfect, but a man whom we honor and whose example we'd be proud to follow. Thank you.